11.55, five minutes to midnight, just in time for one more podcast episode. I'm cosplaying Father Malone. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome back, audience. Welcome back to the One and a Half White Guys podcast, or more unsolicited white guy opinions on movies for long. I'm Nathan, your half white guy. Nick? I'm Nick. You're one <laughs> white guy. White guy. Welcome to the podcast where we talk about comedy. Does this say podcast? <laughs> Welcome to the podcast where we talk about comedy, movies, and urban ghost stories. Or very suburban ghost this stories. Is suburb, this is kind of suburban. It's coastal. This is like a go- coastal town. This is like Fisherman's Town ghost story. This is one of the best ghost movies, and it doesn't take place in a haunted house. Thank God we're not stuck in a haunted house. (laughs) Not like House on Haunted Hill. This isn't some Scooby-Doo house they're all stuck in. We're stuck in an entire town, but for some reason, that town still seems small. I live here. Yeah, it seems small, but it seems too small. Seems like they still might get you. We're here talking about, of course, the fictional town of Antonio Bay, California. The central town to John Carpenter's The Fog. Why are we doing The Fog, Nick? When is this dropping? It is April 21st. The 21st of April. The 100th anniversary of Antonio Bay, which is not even real. We're very excited to get into this, but uh, before we do, we also want to give a shout out. Uh, We got some mugs now made. We're very excited about all of that. Uh, shout out to Brandon who who made these. Uh, Thank for you, us. Yeah, Brandon. Thank, thank, thank you, you very for much. That, and I'll be sipping wine out of this. Uh, we're very excited about all of that. We're very excited to have some of the merch and some stickers. So if you're interested in those, hit us up. We'll we'll send them to you if you p- paste them around and get people to to <laughs> listen to the podcast. To be perfectly honest with you, The Fog, directed by John Carpenter, released in 1980, starring Hal Holbrook as Fodder Malone. <laughs> Fodder. <laughs> we. we, we we Nick and I have this running gag, especially with our friend Joey. Anytime we see like uh, like a, a priest. priest or any father in something, we always go fodder like it's a like it's a because Irish. we watched a lot of Amityville together. Amityville, like that's always priests in an Amityville movie. But also, movie. that's what Killian Murphy. That's how Killian Murphy says it in uh, Twenty Eight Days Later. Remember when he like stumbling into the church the first time? The <laughs> fodder, guys, are you okay? Fod- fodder, <laughs> fodder, <laughs> fodder. <laughs> so it's so we go. John Houseman as Mister Machen. Mr. Machen, of course, is the sea captain in the beginning, which I always just called him as the captain. I never knew that was his name, <laughs> even though even though the kid says his name, I never remembered that. Laurie Strode as Elizabeth Soley, aka Jamie Lee Curtis, <laughs> coming right off her, right off her and John Carpenter's success on Halloween and prom night. And, prom oh, night yeah, was prom the night. very same year. Isn't she? Is she in Terror Train as well? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, Terror Train is the same year as well. Terror Train was eighty. I thought Terror Train is nineteen eighty. Janet Leigh as Kathy Williams. Tom Atkins as Nick Castle. What? Yeah, <laughs> I know, which is the, we'll, we'll get to a piece of trivia about that later. Nick knows exactly why. And Adrian Barbo as the smooth talking voice of Antonio Bay, Stevie Wayne, t- tucking you in to bed every night with some smooth jazz. Nick, would you lead us in with the IMDb summary for The Fog? An unearthly fog rolls into a small coastal town exactly 100 years after a ship mysteriously sank in its waters. This movie, again, we talk about feels like a ghost story, but part of the ghost story is you get to unravel it with the characters because the characters don't know shit either. You don't know yeah. shit. They don't know shit. No one knows a goddamn thing except the crew behind the camera. I <laughs> I love this movie. Do you love this movie? I too? really, really enjoy this movie. Absolutely. Oh, man. This is one of his best ones. I don't think most people consider it one of his best. It's I think such fans, a shame. I think I fans are very fond of it. Yeah. But I don't think this is this isn't usually up there with uh the thing or this seems Halloween to, or big trouble. It yeah. seems to be forgotten a lot, which is a real fucking shame. I'll I think say it that. was mostly forgotten in the past. It seems to have gotten more of a more recognition in the past. Uh, I want to say 20 years. I well, think. that's because there was a great remake. <laughs> we will get to that. We will get to that remake. <laughs> anyway, trust me. but you love this movie too. Yes, we both do. Now, when did you first watch it? Uh, when did I first see The Fog? I think it must have been in college. It's one of those movies that at the time I, when I finished it, I was like, okay, it's over. But the more, when it finished, I thought myself thinking of it more and more and the the ideas behind it more than I did Halloween because it just, the atmosphere it builds and the, 
the tension it grows and just the grand scale of all of it and the simple nature of it all just makes it very enjoyable. Yeah, what you said was interesting. It's it's a it's a very grandiose looking movie, but it's a very small town. But the scenery in this movie, all shot in Northern California, is b- beautiful. Like yeah. it's gorgeous. I think that's the Point Reyes lighthouse they use, if I believe. Yes, and I, I've we'll- been up to the Point Reyes lighthouse, but I didn't connect that it was the one from the fog. This was a couple of years ago, but now I'm like, fuck, I should have. <laughs> 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 Idiot. <laughs> you didn't know. It's okay. Next time, but idiot, it's definitely the way it's shot as well, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, of how big and they, I think, I forget the aspect ratio. I think it's like it's like the cinema scope one. I it's been a while since we've been in film school, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I can't remember. There was all these different formats you learned, and like, I at one point I knew them all, and now I don't know anything. But shot, uh, by, shot by Dean Cundy, yeah, also. yeah. But one of the things he wanted to choose is the reason he wanted to shoot in that like big you know, widescreen thing is that at the end of the day, this is kind of a low budget horror movie. Like this would qualify nowadays. We would call this uh, qualify. This as like a B horror, even though it's really not, but, no, it, no. but, it, but, it fe- but the, the budget they had is, you know, they didn't, weren't able to do that. But if you had that big, you know, widescreen feel, you're like, Oh, this is, this is, this is fucking classy. Yeah, this, this looks is good. nice. Like, yeah, that's exactly what you'd say. Interesting. You say lower budget. Uh, this had, some, this had a definitely a bigger budget than Halloween did. Yes. Uh, yes. A lot more effects, a lot more special effects, practical effects, and just a bigger cast all around. There's a lot of recognizable names for the time in this too. Yeah. You can really tell how big of a success Halloween was because this was his follow-up to it. And he got a lot of money to do this movie. Absolutely. Didn't Hal that? Holbrook, Janet Lee, and John Houseman too. Yeah. Speaking of uh, Hal Holbrook, didn't, wasn't, I'm trying to remember this correct. Correct me. Aren't they, isn't it um, her, him and Adrian Barbeau in Creep Show? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it, it is. is. <laughs> it is. It is them. Yeah, I was like thinking about. It. I was like, I think they're both in that movie. Yeah, I th- are they? They're not married. Yes, they are. They are. no. He's I, yes. I they're married. Remember, in man, the, I don't no, remember all no, the. No, they're married in that. Right he, yeah, he feeds her to Fluffy. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, yeah, go watch Creep Show now. Yeah, people. yeah, yeah. Good like that. You and I have very similar movie watching histories with Wes Craven and John Carpenter. I went on a big Carpenter and Wes Craven kick. Uh, in college and post college, like when we lived together, I watched like it, Memoirs of an Invisible Man and Ghosts of Mars. I couldn't tell you when, but it had to have been one of the first ones I checked out post high school. Nice, because the only two I was watching in high school were Big Trouble and Halloween. But I couldn't tell you the first time I saw this. But this movie, it stuck with me enough that I that I got it on Blu-ray. Got it on Blu-ray. This is Nick's. I have a poster of it in my room. I keep that poster. It was it was when I went to a horror convention. I saw that poster. It was like a small eleven by seventeen. And I was like, oh, my God, that's the one I want. We love talking about movies on this podcast, but we also kind of want to start, you know, hearing what you guys, the ones that listen to us consistently or non-consistently or random person think. I want to know. I want to know kind of what you guys think about the movies we're going to do, because we love movies. and We want to hear what you guys did. So this is a new segment I like to call Tales from the Reddit. We're on a lot of different communities on Reddit, but one of the communities I love going on is the horror movie subreddit. Oh, yeah. And we I posted recently and I said, what do you guys think about Night, John Carpenter's 1980 movie, The Fog. And we I said that we both felt like it seemed to be kind of forgotten. This is a comment from Noir Cristo 8849 Yeah. He commented, this is his opinion of The Fog, quote, it is really fantastic. Classic John Carpenter at his best isn't Halloween movies. Like this is where behind the horror is a sense of a well-inhabited world building. This and the movies of the Millennium Trilogy have such a deep underlying lore that's an incredibly robust story of its own. Millennium Trilogy, right? Is that... He might mean the Apocalypse Trilogy. Could be. Apocalypse Trilogy is what he dubbed uh, The Thing, Prince of Darkness, and In the Mouth of Madness. But we talk about atmosphere in the fog, and this is exactly what he means, right? Building the mystery of what's going on and why it's happening. Uh, This is from Massive underscore Bandicoot underscore 57. Amazing movie. For me, his third best behind Halloween and Assault on Precinct 13, which I do love. We we both do love Assault on Precinct 13. I watch The Fog so many times, I never get tired of it. It's like the ultimate ghost story for me. A great tale of revenge that you could actually believe. The twist at the end where I first watched it was totally unexpected. There's a good twist. Some of his best cinematography on the film, too. The opening sequence and night shots of The Fog coming into the town. Fuck me. Great movie. So with the twist, I think you could be referring to like one or two different things. There's a few things. There's a that few happen. things that happen, I, especially at the end of. This I would movie. don't call them all possible twists, but absolutely. The, he's talking about the cinematography of the town. 
it's oh, gorgeous. God, it's this is a gorgeous beautiful, looking beautiful. movie. The yeah. fog sweeping in. It gives me anxiety just watching it. <laughs> yeah, especially, they, especially us living in San Francisco area where there's so much fog anyway. This was funny. This guy hasn't seen it, but the, what he said is really funny. Uh, <laughs> okay. This guy's this is Carbon Smith 2003. Never seen it before, but I know my mum, mum, M-U-M, so I'm assuming uh, English, British, is absolutely terrified of it. If I mention the movie or make a joke about fog or zombie pirates, she tells me to fuck. <laughs> she tells me to fuck off, so it might be scary. <laughs> I actually responded to him and I said, "Would highly recommend checking it out, if for no other reason than to frighten your mom with other more with other references." <laughs> they're not pirates, though. I know they're not pirates, but you know that's a misunderstanding we can talk about. Yeah, misconstruction. Misconstruction it doesn't mis help that he doesn't help that he dressed them like pirates. Though. They do look like pirates. <laughs> they look like they look like pirates. <laughs> Don't, if you don't understand, we'll get to it. Yeah, we'll get it. But, um, what's the What's the last one? All right, last one. And this was this was wholesome, and I, I felt like I had to throw this in because this, again, a lot of people talked about this movie being cozy, a cozy horror movie. This is from Alice underscore says 1984, and they said, this was one of my first horror experiences as a kid. As the only child of a single horror-loving mom in the 80s, we had one TV and no cable. So I watched what she watched. I absolutely adore everything about this movie. I wanted to be Adrian Barbeau. She was great in it. It's a great story. I responded. That Very sounds nice. like it sounds like I love this story. Such a great memory. It's so cool to hear of like people talk about nostalgia for this movie. Yeah. As scary as it is, people are like, oh, yeah, that's like one of my childhood memories is watching those people get run through with the sword. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's kind of funny. But that's that speaks to horror. Like there's something really fun about Yes, this is really scary and people are getting stabbed and people are dying. But God, there's something just so comforting about it where you can just put it on like nice white noise and go to sleep. There's something about it. That's one of my favorite things about watching movies is making the memories of. Oh, doing absolutely. Them. Yeah. Especially from a younger age. If they stick with you like that in such a good way, then it doesn't matter if what genre it's from. Yeah. If it means something to you, then that's wholesome. Exactly. I got to I got to agree. Uh, first of all, again, thank you so much for letting us share your story. Thanks, guys. Thanks for reaching out. We're glad you love the fog just like we do, and we're excited to talk about it more. And honestly, we're just glad that these stories are, are continuing. People have a, a good feeling surrounding it. And with that, should we get into the plot of this movie? I know why we're so giddy. This is our first Carpenter movie we're oh, doing. Oh, is this the first one? Yeah. Oh, it is. Have we... Oh, we did Shocker for Craven. Yeah. <laughs> what a what a way to start doing Wes Craven was like Shocker, my God. I love that they use the word cozy. That's a very ad accurate adjective to describe this movie because this is this is such a good hunker down, turn all the lights off, and enjoy yourself while eating popcorn or, you know, sipping some wine. Sipping some wine, <laughs> some tea, whatever you want. Sipping know. it like Father Malone. But let's talk about the quote right at the beginning. <laughs> the quote is, is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream. Yes. By Edgar Allan Poe. Yes. The, the movie opens with that quote, and all I can think of was just like, Dr. Loomis's quote at the beginning of Rob Zombie's Halloween is just like the darkest souls are the ones that walk, move silently among us. I'm like, you made that up. <laughs> uh, what do you think that all means, Nick? In relation to, I get why, I get why it said Edgar Allan Poe wrote it, but how do you think it relates to this movie? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? All that tells me is like our eyes can deceive us. Our eyes can deceive us. This movie itself is fictitious. You could even read it that way. You could even say that the reason that they think the town is a good thing is actually f predicated on bullshit. The, the town is predicated on is, is predicated on a lie that maybe we'll get to in a little bit. A dream within a dream. A dream within a dream saying that what you seem is not always what you seem. Because, and that's important, because we cut to the oldest man ever giving children a nice little treat before they go to bed. A very scary ghost story. Yes, we cut to John Houseman as Mr. Machin. 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 Machin, which is really funny because Machin, I think, is... Is it a woman? Girl, yeah, it's girl in, in German. German. Yeah, so that's funny. Mr. Girl is Mr. <laughs> on the beach uh, telling ghost stories to a group of kids. I don't know. It was his shift tonight. I, gu I guess, <laughs> and the, I guess the, the parents of the kids in the town are like, yeah, go hang out down on the beach and hear some scary ghost stories at 11.55 p.m. John Houseman, if you don't know him, he was the driving instructor in The Naked Gun. <laughs> Extend your arm. Extend your middle finger. <laughs> oh, you bastard. We got to blur that. <laughs> I love that this movie opens 
with exposition on the ghost story aspect yes. around a campfire being told to a bunch of kids because the rest of the movie, as it's told, kind of feels like a, a story you'd hear around a campfire. Yep, this feels very realistic to what you'd hear when you're camping. Or that's where the co- spooky that's where the, story. That's really where the cozy element comes from, too. Yeah, nice fire, hearing some something scary about something that goes bump in the night, but you're okay because you're right next to a bright fire that's going to keep you safe. Yeah, until it, it goes out. It's his only scene in the movie, and but his his presence and his delivery are. You know, they set the atmosphere beautifully. Yes. Like he tells this story and he says, 1155, five minutes to midnight, just in time for one more story. He tells this story of this clipper ship that uh, crashed on the rocks just like outside, just right where they are. Right, basically. About three feet away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it mistook a fire on the beach yeah. for a lighthouse because yes. they were lost in this really random thick fog. Yes. And uh, they, they weren't found. Nobody was found. The ship went down. Yeah. And the ship was called the Elizabeth Dane. And he said, if the fog ever returns, the spirits will rise from their watery graves. To Antonio Bay. Antonio Banderas? No. And he goes, (laughs) and he goes, remember, this is the 21st of April. And then it hits midnight and he goes, midnight, the 21st of April. How many stoners do you think love watching this movie? Like right before 420 ends? Yeah. Just, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Hey man, I have a great idea. <laughs> oh dude, it's almost the 21st. Yeah, let's do that. Do you have the fog? I don't know. I, I do have the fog. I make my own fog. <laughs> <laughs> this is stupid. Yeah, before we go on, the score in this is great. The score is great. We get a little bit of an intro with it. We don't get the full score, I don't think, when it hits yet. Theme of the movie itself has got this quintessential horror movie sounding organ leading the main theme in. And it has this drone and piano melody mixed with uh, sounds of a synthesizer following yeah. the same melody. Mm. It, it just evokes, here's what I've written down, it evokes a shadowy sense of mystery and anxiety. Yeah. It's pleasantly eerie. Whereas, like, the Halloween score kind of evoked dread and danger more than anything. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. This makes sense because we get this nice intro to to horror and this is going to be scary. And then we get a whole day of development. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But this first night goes on for, like, the first 30 minutes. Yes. Hal Holbrook who plays Father Malone, who's drinking all the communion wine He's again. <laughs> Father, <laughs> where did all the communion wine go? Christopher Lee was offered the role of Father Malone, but I guess he couldn't do it. He just agreed to something else already, so he turned it down. That's surprising. If he could do it, he probably would have because he regret. He totally admitted he regrets not doing Dr. Loomis. For Halloween, because oh, he, he was offered oh, yeah, Dr. Loomis. Oh, yeah, he was, yeah. yeah. He's, like, I sh-. He's like, I should have done the role. <laughs> Ichabod Crane, we are sending you to Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it's not. I love Christopher Lee, but I'm glad it's not him in Halloween because Donald Pleasance just makes that character. Well, of course. Come to life. I gave him six shots. <laughs> <laughs> it's the hundredth anniversary of Antonio Bay. A hundred years ago, the town was founded into a township. Mm-hmm. Spooky <laughs> stuff like, happens. I have written down it's the hundredth year anniversary of the town. So that means the supernatural gets an excuse to do something wild. Yeah. The supernatural takes its first attempt at making things creepy in the town by ripping a brick out of the wall. <laughs> and scaring Hal Holbrook and scaring, to death. <laughs> and scaring Father Malone and throwing it onto his desk. Yeah, but what is behind that brick in the wall? A, I think the diary of Father Malone. Not, not him, Father Malone. His great grandfather. Father Malone. Old Father Malone from like 1880, 1880. Because it's the 100th year. 100th year. And he goes, I haven't seen this before. And that audio and that brick turns on the radio. Well, he drops the radio. Well, yeah, he drops the radio. Yeah. That's why it turns on. And the radio comes on Stevie Wayne, played by Adrian Barbeau. Adrian Barbeau. Who's more or less the main character. But this whole movie has like... This movie has quite an ensemble cast to it, yeah. but an ensemble character, cast of characters too. Like you follow a handful of different people and their adventures of what's going on. And that's really a great way to tell a story set in a very small town. She runs this uh, radio station out of the Point Reyes Lighthouse. Point Reyes Lighthouse. This is actually Adrian Barbeau's first uh, like theatrical like first full length film. Yeah. Uh, she and John Carpenter, they were married. They were the married. Yeah. So she, so he, he wrote this role, especially for her. 
in there. I was reading. <laughs> I'll write you in, baby. Yeah, I'll write you in. <laughs> Please be in my movie. The radio station that plays exclusively jazz because that way they could didn't have to get away with paying. <laughs> it's super copyright. soothing late night jazz yeah. music. She's got a great voice for it too. She's like, this is Stevie Wayne coming at you live with KAB Radio. So I was reading she also patented her voice after Allison Steele, who was like a DJ in the 1960s. Nice. So she's got that nice, smooth listening voice. Stay awake with me. Creepy, weird shit starts happening in this town. Like, things start vibrating, things start moving, car alarms start going off well, for no the reason. Ghosts, well, the ghosts were shaking things, mostly because this dude that's working in a grocery store took a fucking orange juice carton <laughs> off the shelf, drank from it, and then put it back. How dare he? That's so the why go- they're... The ghosts are really <laughs> fucking mad. I would be mad, too. The ghosts are mad. Number one, the father's drunk. That's why they're pissed. Number two, this guy just doesn't pay for his orange juice and leaves it there after he took a sip out of the carton. What a gross fuck. <laughs> they're not haunting it because they're mad about what happened 100 years ago. They're haunting the town because of him. Yeah, they, you, you guys, <laughs> this is just horrible. What the fuck are you doing? So, But I love this opening. Have you ever walked around your hometown in the dead of night, in the middle of the night when no one is around? Yeah, there's gunshots usually. <laughs> well, when there's not gunshots, <laughs> it can be kind of creepy, right? Yeah, well, it, when, it's, when things are just dead still in the middle of the night, yeah. It definitely can. When you it's know what quiet I'm, you know what I'm trying to talk. You know what I'm trying to say though, right? Yeah. What? Sorry about the gunshots. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's not. That's why what happens here. The ghosts just start firing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> keep the keep the property value low. <laughs> the ghosts go around and just kind of start doing. I would think just general hooliganry in the in the middle of the night. On the, at least at first, they start. What is it? Raising like fucking with the cars, honking horns. Lowering a car on the raising a car on the lift in the in the mechanic shop. Yeah, just pumping gas into shaking nothing. Shaking bottles at the store, pumping gas, just basically being nuisances. Uh, who who gets their chair moved? Nancy Loomis. Nancy Loomis. Yeah, who does not mention that? Oh yeah, ever she, in the movie, she sees her chair just like move across her bedroom floor because she comes out to see, hey, what's going on with all these cars? And the chair just like moves across the living room floor, and she goes. Just another day in she's, paradise. Yeah, she's she's like, like, no huh. problem. I guess I'll go back in. Huh, that usually doesn't happen. That's not what's supposed to happen here. But She's over this supernatural shit because she, you know, you know, Michael Myers like choked her out, cut yeah. her throat, and then, <laughs> and then uh, you know, made a shrine out of her to his dead sister. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> yeah, pay phones start going off. The gas starts pumping itself. It's, uh, it's, it's really random. Just another night in paradise. But we also get to meet uh, Lori Strode herself. We get our introduction to Jamie Lee Curtis playing Elizabeth. Elizabeth. And just, uh, who else do we see? Uh, who else do we see with her? Uh, Tom Atkins. Who's playing? <laughs> he plays a guy named Nick Castle. Why is the name Nick Castle significant, Nick? Nick Castle. Nick, Nick yourself, Nick Castle. Nick Castle is a real person. He's a He was a friend of John Carpenter. Nick Castle played Michael Myers in the original Halloween. John Carpenter <laughs> named a bunch of the characters in this movie after his friends. Yep. There's also a Dan O'Bannon. Yeah. There's also, a, that's the weatherman's name. Yeah, Dan, Dan O'Bannon. Yeah. And I think one of the other guys' names is uh, Tom. Is it Tommy Wallace? It might be. Yeah. yeah. Tom Atkins, he's a fisherman. He's just driving home and he picks up Jamie Lee Curtis, who's hitchhiking, and they immediately hit it off. It's just like they, they, they become fast friends and also experience something traumatic by, you know, when the windows just get blown out of his car <laughs> for no reason. Yeah, because she's, she's hitchhiking. He picks again, her up. The ghosts are just causing shenanigans. He, she's hitchhiking. He picks her up and she's like, I'm going to. Vancouver, Vancouver from that and then she's just driving and she, she was like are you weird and he goes yes and she goes oh okay <laughs> that's fine yeah good good windows <laughs> just explode out yeah in a car <laughs> oh my god which is again terrifying and then if I was to be honest if I was uh Tom Atkins character I'd be like what the fuck my windows what the fuck in modern day this is like this is like two thousand dollars <laughs> oh, like no. like you're just like oh my god dude Horrible. Stevie Wayne is like, hey, shout out to everyone that's on the the seagrass, seagrass boat that's still out. Is they fishing? What yeah, it's they a doing? little trawler out on the like 15 miles out. Yeah, and he's like, that fog is going to roll in. And she hits up the weatherman. And he's no, like, he let confirms me. confirms there's a fog bank. There's a fog in. bank. And he goes, let me take you to dinner. And she goes, uh, no. <laughs> so, <and laughs> yeah, he he keeps, yeah, he keeps trying to get with her a little bit. He's trying to get with her. And she's like, shout out to the guys on the seagrass. Keep it going on. Keep safe out there. And then the fog rolls over them and everything really starts to escalate very quickly. 
They they do they are not safe. They this are fog. this fog. They're like, hey, there's some lights in the fog, which is never a good thing. Best case scenario, it's an actual ship, and I don't think they see you. Yeah, these three guys, <laughs> these three, you're run over. Yeah, these three guys getting drunk on the seagrass. They see this. Oh, one of them's played by George Buckflower. Who's, yeah. uh who's uh, the crazy drunk driver guy from Oh, Back, Back to, to the, the Future. Future. Oh, he's right. He's Mayor, to- re-elect Mayor Red Thomas. Progress is his middle name. That's before Goldie Wilson takes over in the 80s. Yeah. And by the 80s, Mayor Red <laughs> by Thomas. In the 50s. Yeah. Oh, no. So Goldie, Goldie Wilson's, oh, so t- yeah, Mayor Red Thomas is the 50s. And then by the 80s, he's just like a drunk on yeah, the bench. Yeah, he's a yeah. fucking homeless guy. <laughs> Drinking on the bench. Crazy where you drunk, drunk drivers. <laughs> As Marty McFly backs the DeLorean out, out of, of the, the porn yeah. theater. <laughs> Listen, he couldn't stop. He was going 88 miles an hour when he hit that fucking lightning bolt. <laughs> George Buckflower, he plays a drunk guy and everything. He's one of the three guys that are on the seagrass. He's like, there's no fog bank out there. Fog bank rolls in. There's lights flashing in, in it. <laughs> in the in the, in fog, the fog. And he's like, hey, there's a fog bank out there. They go out there and the fog <laughs> is thick. takes over their entire boat. They can barely see a thing. And then the, everything on the boat just starts shutting down. This is not good. Listen, this isn't gonna. This isn't about to be good for you. <laughs> <laughs> they go up on deck, and this is so cool. You only see set, you only see a couple of shots of it, even though the production value for it looks enormous. A big old fucking old timey sailboat like rolls on past them. Yeah, looks look, like a big old pirate ship. Looks like an actual pirate ship. Again, this is something that it's a big clipper ship that they, rolls past them. There's just a couple of quick shots of them, and they're just in awe of like what they're seeing, and then it just disappears into the fog. Well, it went and found a, I told you, it went and found a little cave, little cave. It sealed itself in, and then a couple of years later, uh, Sean Astin and his friends would find it. <laughs> <laughs> and with uh, Joey Pants and... Uh, Vanilla. Robert Robert Davi Robert Davi would, would would steal the money from uh, One Eyed Willie. They would be trying to find One Eyed Willie's treasure. <laughs> that was One Eyed Willie's ship. What a crossover! What a crossover! The other one I was thinking is the <laughs> is the uh, Javier Bardem and his crew get trapped in a cursed oh, cave. Oh yeah, thanks in, to Johnny Depp in the in the what is it the most recent pirate movie? Right? Yeah, that that last one that Jack, came out. Jack the Sparrow. <laughs> Jack Sparrow. Sparrow. <laughs> That's how he sounds. Javier Bardem and his crew of ghost pirates, of go- of like ghost sailors, they literally are just doing the pirate ghosts from the fog in that movie. <laughs> they just show up and it's like the fog. Yeah. And that's funny. That's a that's a good way to put it. I never really thought of it like that, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen what is it? Dead men? Dead, no, fucking. I don't know. I don't but remember the most. On stranger, t- was it on stranger time? No, no, it was dead men tell no tales. Dead men tell no tales. Okay, then yes, I haven't seen that in a bit, but yeah, I can see it like that. They're like, what the hell was that? And then they see somebody on their deck in the fog, and these guys get. Fucked up by these ghosts, they get man. Stabbed constantly. They Everyone's get, got a sword. They're they, getting fucking stabbed and run through with like and also cargo like hooks, and cargo stuff. hooks. Yeah. And stuff. Oh, it's brutal. Like they just it, they get massacred by by some very ghostly looking figures. I do want to say as well, uh, the lead ghost, the one that looks really tall. You know that one, Blake. He, he's like, yeah, he was actually played by. He's played by Rob Button. Yeah, Rob Button. So you yeah. know, you know this one already, right? He was the. He's like a. He's the makeup artist. Makeup artist who did, I, who's famously did the makeup for the thing. The thing, yeah. So, uh, but I, apparently, like when he said he wanted to play it, John Carpenter was like, "Stand up," just so he could see how tall he was. But Button was like, "I thought he was gonna fire me. He was gonna be like, stand up and get out." <laughs> <laughs> but he was like, "No, you're tall enough. Go ahead, get yourself, get yourself into makeup. Put somebody else in charge of your makeup because you're gonna go stand out there with a sword and not say anything." Jamie Lee Curtis had a similar story when she made Halloween. She, um, it was the first really? day. Of, it was the first day of filming. She got back to the hotel. Yeah, and uh, she wasn't feeling very confident about her first day. And then John Carpenter called her, and she thought, "Oh, this is it. He's he's gonna sack me. He's he doesn't want me, me yeah. on this shoot and whatnot." And turns out he just called her to say, hey, thank you so much. You did great on your first day. I'm looking forward to working with you tomorrow. Oh, my God. I was like, oh, that's so sweet. This is like the same thing when, what is it? This is a side where, uh, was it Thomas Elf Wilson thought he was going to get fired off Back to the Future? Oh, did he? No, well, he thought, but it turns out they were just firing Eric Stoltz, the first Marty McFly. Oh, yeah. They were going to get Michael J. Fox instead. And he was like prepared to walk into like Rob Zemeckis and Bob Gale and just be like, be like, please let me be Biff Tanner. And he's like that. And he was just going to say, okay, you know what? I'm just going to let it go. I'll, I'll just say thank you for letting me go. And he was he walked in. He saw like apparently Crispin Glover and Leah Thompson there as well. And he was like, 
oh my god, we're all getting fired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're all fucked? And then they, they were like, is everything okay? It's like, you guys are fine, but we have had to fire Eric. And he goes, oh, okay. Oh, thank god. <laughs> Why did they fire? He just, still, they they, didn't they like couldn't him. elicit the performance they wanted out of him. That was like the basic thing. Wow. They were giving him, they were giving him the, the instructions, as they said, and they said, we could not get the performance we wanted out of Eric. So they fuck up the crew of the Seagrass. <laughs> oh, they, royally like, like everyone, so everyone's dead. All the instruments are blown out. Everyone's more than dead. <laughs> okay, the not pirate ghosts decide, <laughs> all right, we've, we've, done, we've done some vandalism. We smashed some windows. We rattled some things. We honked some horns. We moved one lady's chair across the floor. That scared her. We killed a bunch of people. <laughs> we also vandalized a church. <laughs> <laughs> but what would really wrap up my my day of ghosting is a nice game of ding dong ditch. So what they decide to do because <laughs> they go to shore because Tom Atkins and Jamie Lee Curtis, that's Nick Castle and, and Elizabeth, have gotten to know each other very intimately and quickly. Here's an ominous knock at knock. his front door. And not like a normal pump knock. It sounds like something metal is clicking against the wall. Well, multiple uh, times, like they keep knocking. Yeah. While Stevie Wayne's radio station is still playing mm -hmm. the smooth jazz, she's been serenading these men getting killed the entire night. <laughs> <laughs> the, everyone, imagine, imagine you're on the boat and you're like, oh my God, I am going to be killed to Miles Davis right now. <laughs> Which honestly, I wouldn't mind. Like he, Miles Davis is fucking amazing, but like, imagine like, this the thought. Like, uh oh, like, this is how I go. What's the worst song to accidentally die to? What's got to be the worst one? Get stabbed by by not pirates too. Let us know. Uh, it's Tom Atkins' character. Here's the knock, and he's like, "Well, I'm gonna go investigate that real quick." And I don't know why he does because you can see a clear silhouette of somebody that. First of all, again, it looks like they have seaweed hanging off of them. Yeah, and. <laughs> skinny and they, they don't, don't look, look normal they don't look very well kept he, you can see the hook in his hand <laughs> he's, like, he's holding a weapon he's got a cargo hook and he's knocking on the door like that and he's like well i'll go investigate this that is not what i would do the second i see that i'm getting a weapon my of my own i'm <laughs> like oh my god why would he have a hook <laughs> but nothing happens to tom atkins because one o'clock strikes yes and, and they play a nice game at ding dong ditch and they go boom fuck off they're like, ah, oh, damn, we ran out of time. Nothing else happens. And that's the end of the night. We cut to the next morning and Stevie's uh, little son, his name is Andy. He mm. was uh, one of the kids that was hearing the ghost story at the beginning by Mr. Machin. Yeah, Ma Machin, Machin, who we uh, don't want to point. Mr. Machin never comes back. I assume he just like was like, well, got to get out of this fucking town before these things start coming in. <laughs> oh, he knows what's coming. I'll yeah. scare the children really quick and take off. I'll catch uh, I'll catch a little bit. You can tip me for this story and then I'll leave <laughs> type thing. It's now six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Time to go on my sabbatical before they show these up. These fucking ghosts come get me. <laughs> uh, we get to meet a couple other characters in the town, like Nancy Loomis's um, Sandy, and uh, mm -hmm. Janet Lee plays uh, Mrs. Williams, who's organizing the hundredth anniversary. Is she like, the mayor? Who is she? Is no, she's like a city oh, official. Oh, she's just like someone in the town. I always thought she was the mayor or something. I don't know. No, she's like a city official. Oh, okay. She's organizing the big. Uh, 100 centennial yeah yeah 100 year centennial square like statue reveal here's yes. this big event for all the town's folks to be a part of and yes. whatnot. we turn 100 today blah 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 tom atkins and jamie lee curtis well J jamie lee curtis likes tom atkins so much that she just tags along with him everywhere he goes in the rest of the movie yeah but he knows those guys on the seagrass yeah because they didn't come back he he's like i gotta go look for him what happened to him one of the best things about this movie is how it builds the mystery up of what's going on oh yeah like you don't know what's happened no one really knows it's like given to all of us including the viewers and these characters piece by piece there's right? little subtle lines that the yeah. characters will say like <clears throat> oh the fog is blowing west and uh, the wind is going east what kind of fog moves against the wind a super a spooky one mm -hmm. or things like tom atkins when he and jamie lee curtis find the seagrass but no one aboard and yeah. he says things like i cleaned this boat two days ago and yes. now it looks like it just got like sunk in the water yes mm -hmm. this really creepy subtle dialogue like when uh, darwin Jostin, who's the doctor because they end up finding one of the bodies yes. on the ship well it falls on jamie lee <laughs> <laughs> He's checking the body out and he goes up to Tom Atkins and the things he's saying are really creepy. It's just like, I saw this guy less than a week ago and now I'm looking at his corpse and it looks like, and I have diagnosed that he has been underwater for more than a month. Because they find the seagrass. They're out, they're out, they're out on patrol looking for it and they find <laughs> that thing. 
and it's abandoned. It's they can't. First of all, there's no bodies on it. There's salt water everywhere. Salt water everywhere. All the instruments are smashed. The thing looks like it was torn up by a hurricane inside. Yeah, it looks like something freezing. Yeah, like just came by. Yeah, and that's when uh, Tom Atkins also has the monologue about finding the doubloon. Right. This is one of my favorite parts. Is the the doubloon story he tells. I think it really lends itself to the folklore mm-hmm. aspect of the backstory for the the story and the plot itself. It's it's always unsettling and ominous when. The things people can't explain get passed down in story form from generation to generation, you know? Yeah. Like something is still out there, whether it's the answers or the monster, but it was never found and that's the spooky part. Yeah. This movie is like the spooky part was found out. Now it's going to come back to haunt you in very fateful and violent ways. Yes. <laughs> His father goes out and finds this abandoned ship. He goes aboard and he finds that there's no crew. Yes. Uh, the dinner, like the dining room is set and there's also a gold doubloon on the table. So he takes the doubloon, but when he gets back home, he tries to show it to his family. It's gone. Yes. Like it's not in his pocket anymore. It, it definitely there. So there's a common ghost story, right? Which is, I think, bottled off the story of the Mary, the Mary Celeste, which was a, which was a ship in the 1800s where they went aboard and they found food and the food was still hot and you know, everything was set and the candles were lit, but people weren't on board. Then th- this was like a, a thing that happened or I, I forget how much of it is fake and how much of it is, but there was like an abandoned ship and they were like, oh my God, uh, you know, what happened? But they, they tur- turns out there's probably an actually reasonable explanation. There's something like what used to happen with ships where like, a, like gas would fill. So it wasn't a, they weren't able to be in it. So what they would do it to air out the ship is tie everyone in like a lifeboat off the back to like let the ship air out. But they, what they imagine might have happened is the, the 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 line broke and they sailed away from the ship. So when they people found the ship that had everything on it, they were like, "Where is everyone?" Well, they were gone about twenty minutes ago that way. <laughs> uh, so you need to find them. And then they never found it. But yeah, those. I mean, it's a haunting story, right? Where did these people go? Same thing was like a lighthouse one time. There's all these maritime stories about people vanishing. <laughs> those are some of the best there's, stories. There's, there's a lighthouse in like the 1800s where they were like, "Where are the two lighthouse keepers?" and they were like, where are they? And then meanwhile, they're drinking. They're, eat, they're eating lobsters. They're, eat, they're eating lobsters. <laughs> they're, drink, they're drinking and dancing together inside. They're drinking turpentine. They're drinking turpentine. <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh my God. I do, we do love the lighthouse. But yeah, there's a lot of these maritime ghost stories. It, it's a very unique story. You know, there's always the, the ghost story about things that go bump in the night in the woods. But a maritime ghost story, a sea ghost story. Ooh, that's spooky. Oh, Jesus. Those will, those will get under your skin. Yeah, I think it ma- I think it ma- you know kind of matches the the peaceful slow build, but also the ferocity of the ocean. You know, the ocean can be really dangerous, but a lot of times the ocean's pretty chill. Except sometimes it's not so chill anymore. <laughs> ocean, just like these fucking ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we might leave it here. We don't want to go through the whole plot and, and no, spoil everything. No, this is great. This we is want something you to watch. You really this. need to watch on your own. There, there's so much fun in it. It's a great, great ghost story to watch, and we, we highly recommend it. And it takes place on the 21st of April. Not, ah. not a Halloween time movie, but more like a, it seems like going late spring going into summer. Yeah, the use of the fog and the mist in this movie is 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 really fun. Like, I love the mm. shots of how they reverse the footage of making the fo- of making it look like the fog is like creeping into one of the compartments yeah. and stuff. To uh, to mess with the machinery, it look they're making it look like it's deliberately deliberately moving in there. Uh, it blows itself around and like puffs of giant smoke, wherein it appears somewhere. It's almost kind of like it's a character in the movie. And the ex the excess of it when characters are walking through it or standing right in it is fun. And like the crew off camera, I can only imagine the crew off camera is constantly producing it with machines. Yeah, somewhere. yeah. Uh, but the faraway shots are great with special effects. Like when Stevie's looking out at the bay, seeing it roll through onto the town, those still hold up. Like there's even a really cool shot of it coming over a hill. Yeah. It's, I, I, they hold up. I was reading as well. John Carpenter said that he had a couple inspirations from this movie. Uh, the first was some movie. It was a British horror film I was reading called The Crawling Eye. Have you seen that? No. Neither have I. Uh, I'm going to have to check it out. Uh, the Crawling Eye, uh, I guess it deals with monsters also in the fog. Don't go into the fog. There's lots of shit in there, apparently. <laughs> Don't do that. And I guess uh, when they were with Deborah Hill as well, when they went to Stonehenge, there was a bunch of fog over when they were like vacationing. And they were like, what if there was something in here? 
And then John Carpenter's like, what if it was pirates? And <laughs> or no, I'm just kidding. And then he said, what if an old guy with an army of robots stole one of Stonehenge <laughs> and decided to use it to make, <laughs> yeah, that to make a, Halloween it, masks? It makes Halloween masks for some reason. <laughs> we had a time getting it here. Yeah, what is, <laughs> you wouldn't believe how we did it. Against- Tom Atkins is like, when would you do this? He's like, when you were betting those three different women earlier in the movie, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we both do love Hall. I love Halloween three season of the witch. It's like my favorite one. I think we can move to the fact section. Yes. What do you think? The fact section is real facts about this movie that I've researched. Nick has never seen these before and he's going to read them live for you. And again, these are real facts. Fact number one, the fog was released on February 1st, 1980. I could not find opening weekend box office numbers, but it earned a total of 21 million while in theaters, placing it at number 4,529 on the all-time inflation-adjusted domestic box office list. Some of its competition in the spring of 1980 included Cannibal Holocaust (laughs) and Maniac, starring Tom Savini's head. Have you seen Maniac? No. Oh, it's totally worth it. Uh, I, you really do need to see it. Tom Savini is in it as like this creepy. He's like this creepy. The the, the main guy that you're following is like a mer- serial killer, but it's so eccentric. But the Tom Savini's like this sleazy dude hitting on this girl, and at one point his head gets like blown apart. Nice. It's <laughs> so good. He like modeled his own head. Uh, yeah. Go see. Go see Maniac. It's amazing. I got to see it at the Balboa with the actual director. Uh, so I couldn't find a lot of. Um, box office info on this movie. I guess there wasn't a lot, at least through the numbers. I mean, here's the thing too. I just stick with the numbers, the website. I mean, other places have like watch mojo has all their shit too, but I'm like, I, I just general on, on principle. Don't do that shit. Um, regard, <laughs> regardless. So I couldn't find anything like that, but I know like internationally, at least from what I saw, it might've only been because it was released way later internationally as well, but it was only like $500 internationally that doesn't seem right uh but i'm just going with what the box office says uh if you know better just go ahead and hit us up and say hey that's not right you're right i agree with you it probably made more but at least that's what i'm going by uh would you like to guess top movies top movies of 1980 no <laughs> 1980 cool. i know let's see if you can do it one i bet you can get one i know you will get the oh, first one geez. it's a sequel Sequel to a very popular oh, Empire. <laughs> Empire Strikes Back is number one. Good job. Number two. This features a very popular um, country singer. Is it Dolly? Yes. Is it Best Little Whorehouse? No. <laughs> Nine to five. Nine to five was 1980? 1980, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, number three, Stir Crazy. Oh, with uh, Gene Wilder mm-hmm. and uh, Richard Pryor. And uh, I think I can give you two more. Uh, number four. I haven't seen this movie in forever. Kramer v. Kramer. Oh, Kramer versus Kramer. What a what an uplifter. <laughs> and five is any which way you can. And I don't think I've seen that one, to be perfectly honest. Neither have I. Okay, those are, we haven't seen any which way you can. Sorry, none of us have seen Both of us have not seen that one. Kramer versus Kramer. That thing quite warms the heart. Like divorce. <laughs> like divorce. Fact number two. At one point during the movie, Tom Atkins' character mentions Bodega Bay. That is the scene of another horror movie, The Birds, from 1963. When Tippi Hedren's character pulls into town, all hell breaks loose. The same for when Jamie Lee Curtis pulls into town in the fog. Let this be a lesson, people. Do not let strange women into your town unless you want rabid birds or leper ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Is that, is that giving it away that it's leper ghosts? Uh, oh, who cares? <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah. See, I don't know. Every time. Is, is, is there another room where like a, like a girl comes into town and like some weird shit starts to happen? Yeah, the Fog remake. Oh, yeah, the Fog <laughs> remake. So see what happens. You either get rabid birds that are being assholes or just ghosts showing up in the fog. For every, every time Jamie Lee just shows up, all this shit starts to go down. <laughs> this was a nice place before you showed up, and now Michael Myers is here. How do you explain this? Well, he's my brother. You, know. <laughs> you and Lindsay Lohan changed bodies halfway through this movie again. Fact number three. In the 1990s, John Carpenter mentioned during an interview that he was interested in producing an anthology series based on The Fog. However, the proposed series would have focused more in The Fog itself and implications behind it. He also implied that as the series progressed, connective ties to his 1980 film would become more apparent. The idea was scrapped in place of the 2005 sequel, which we all know was a hit. (laughs) 
Listen, we're really just bagging on the 2005 fog. It deserves to be bagged on. Like, it, there's no way. Like, oh, man. We've watched it. We watched it during the pandemic. And okay, after we watched the original one again, we were like, oh, I'd love to see the fog again. And then we watched the, the remake, and I was like, there's a remake? And I you remember like, a goddamn thing about it other than it was just one of the most boring movies I've boring ever seen. shit. And I just remember Fallout Boy, Selma Blair, and... That's it. That's it. Maggie Grace is in it, too. She's the... She's... She's Jamie Lee's character. Jamie Lee's character. Oh, yeah. And there's like a whole side thing where like she might be like the Don't spoil it. We're going to do, like, do it someday. Yeah, we're going like, to do it someday. It's so dumb. It starts to it's go terrible. really off the rails. And I get what they're trying to do, right? As a remake, you got to like improve. You got to do more than the original one. But that wasn't the way to go about it. <laughs> but that would be cool. What about it? I just hear like Snoke. You failed. <laughs> what about a, an anthology series based on the fog? Would you watch that? Oh yeah, focusing on like the fog showing up in other places and like different ideas. It wouldn't. I, I bet it wouldn't just have just kind of like how he was trying to do with Halloween. It wouldn't have been just the ghosts and the fog. I bet there's some other stuff. There was a show on Peacock called Suburban Screams, and it was the first time John Carpenter directed uh, oh, again. Really? And it just came out last uh, last October. Oh, I was watching a bit of that. Yeah, yeah. He directed I think one or two of the episodes. And I haven't had a chance to check it out yet, but uh, John Carpenter did actually return to TV uh, nice. just last year. Oh, okay. Very cool. Very cool. I would love to see, I would like to see a direct sequel to, we talked about it, but Season of the Witch. I want a season. direct sequel to Season of the Witch. Nicholas Cage's Season of the no, Witch. No, you bastard. No. <laughs> That's, we recorded that episode. It's still not out. <laughs> <laughs> we... We record. No, it's never we coming. Have to. It's never coming out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just I have a quick fact for you. When after Carpenter shot most of the fog, he was really unhappy with uh, what he came up with. So a lot of the violent scenes are reshoots, like when the guys get massacred on the seagrass. Yeah, and when Deborah Hill, they try to add more of the supernatural element into it. When the town kind of comes alive at the beginning. Uh, yeah. with everything being possessed, the phones ringing, the cars, alarms going off and yeah. whatnot. Deborah Hill actually uh, shot a lot of those scenes nice. herself. So that's cool. So I, I a lot remember, of this movie, yeah. a lot of this, a lot of the finished product is reshoots because they, John Carpenter was so unsatisfied with everything he had made. He thought like, this is incomprehensible and boring. What no a typical artist. This. Yeah. I, I would see that thing. It's like, it's shit. <laughs> Yeah, but you made it. I don't care. I don't care. Never <laughs> let it see the light of day. Yeah, I read that. I also read that he was trying to not get an R rating because he was like, that's why there's like no blood and stuff like that in the movie. Mm -hmm. And it still got an R rating anyway. Is it R? Yeah, it got an R rating anyway. Well, Halloween's an R. Yeah. For sheer terror alone. Sheer terror. But this is just like, they were, he was just like, this, this movie got an R for just sheer meanness. <laughs> the meanness of the ghost. They're just assholes. You get not rated R for oh, they're that. they're scorn, dude. Like they're out to settle a score. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the what a story mark. This is the most interesting fact I've found about the movie. Uh, Nick is going to read it and rate it one of five, one out of five marks for you, or however many marks for you. And again, in a vein of our hero Tommy Wiseau. <laughs> What a story, Mark. John Houseman's opening monologue, which is supposed to transpire over a course of five minutes from 11.55 to 12 o'clock midnight, is in fact only two minutes and 25 seconds long <laughs> from the moment he mentions it is 11.55 to the moment the bells ring in the background signaling midnight. This is like the opposite of that Dragon Ball Z time where five minutes on Namek turns into an extra four episodes of time. <laughs> This is the opposite. I was like, somehow this shortened the time. You remember like Dragon Ball Z? It's like you have five minutes till Namek explodes and it's like another three or four episodes on there. <laughs> and I was like, God damn. <laughs> this dude's on this forever. But it's like the opposite. It's like, he's like five minutes till midnight. Well, I wrap this up fairly quickly, actually. Guess we'll just sit here. <laughs> Those are nice shoes, Timmy. <laughs> Those little kids. These kids don't know how to tell time anyway. Who cares? <laughs> we're all of a sudden it's midnight. Yeah, so it, it's not that long. And we actually timed this. We were watching it a little before. I actually checked it. I was like, what, what, what did I say? We started and he goes, it's midnight. And I go, it is three it's minutes. Three minutes. After. Three minutes into the movie. <laughs> this can't be. You get four out of five. Four out of five. This made me laugh. All right, good. Four out of five marks. This is such a timeless 
atmospheric ghost story. I love this movie. Check this one out. Like, if yeah. you are yeah. interested in John Carpenter filmography, make this one of the first ones you see. You love this too. This is so comforting and cozy. And for some reason, like, if I, and I know it's not easy to do this, but this is what I would call a wholesome horror movie. No, wholesome. I don't know why. It's just very <laughs> relaxing to watch this. This is like the perfect story to just chill in like you talked about have a fire i I just imagine myself with like a glass of wine or like a, a glass of whiskey cold keeping it there or maybe some tea and just like watching this movie i can just imagine just that scene well it's raining outside maybe oh perfect that's the feeling i get perfect. watching uh most of his most of carpenter's early yeah. movies too especially like Assault on Precinct 13 or Escape from New York, they don't have to be horror. Oh, yeah. Like no, a lot I of those movies, those, yeah. a lot of those movies give that kind of feeling of just like you want to hunker down on any day of the week because you just need a good Carpenter movie. You have tons to pick. Yeah. Maybe not Ghost of Mars, but <laughs> <laughs> that one's a little. The uh, Last Starfighter. That was, uh, isn't it Castle? Yeah, I know, but still, he's a, he's producing it. I think he helped produce it, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah I, I don't remember. Uh, did he? Uh, I think so. Did he? I've actually never seen it. You never seen The Last Starfighter? Nope. Okay, well, we need to watch that next. That stars uh, Jimmy from Halloween 2. Yeah, uh, yeah. What, what, what's the, what's the one, what's the one with, what's the one on with Dan O'Brien? What's the, Dark Star, right? Dark Star. Dark Star, yeah. That, that's Which was one. John Carpenter's... Um, was, it, was his, it was his student film. Yeah, yeah. That he got a, that he got a good release for. Because people were really impressed with it. Yeah. Benson, so. Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> well, you better you better make sure that's right or else we're, well, we're going to get comments on this anyway. Be like, actually, no. Am actually. And you know what? We welcome those comments because we don't know everything. We fully admit we don't know everything. I don't know you. I, I've been thinking about it. It's an 85. 85. 85? Love it. 85. Good job. 88 for me. 85, 88. Perfect. Right on board. All right. 85 plus 88 divided by 2 is an 86.5. Perfect type of ghost movie we recommend it in the summer spring you know whenever whenever but we really do we really do enjoy this movie let's move on to the final portion of the podcast this is a new one i like to call we might be swapping around with some of these last games but i like this one this is the explain a film plot badly oh, okay. we've done this one before what do we do this for uh we did this morbius for... i think <laughs> yeah. yeah we did this for morbius but this one's a little bit different this is one i know you've seen and you enjoy all right, this is the film plot explained badly, Nick. Can you solve this? I mm, bet you will be able shoot. to. All right, an opera star, an ice hockey player, and a lumberjack and an arsonist all fall victim to a Bakersfield villain. An What? An opera star, an ice hockey player, a lumberjack, and an arsonist all fall victim to a Bakersfield villain. Hoodwinked? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's not hoodwinked. <laughs> Fuck! Um, an opera star? Yeah. An ice hockey player, a lumberjack, and an arsonist all fall victim to a Bakersfield villain. It's the running man. It's the running man. Nick got it after another hint. God it's the running man. It. That's right. That's I hate that I needed a hint. Arnold <laughs> Arnold ends up on a game show as is he which one is he in that one? He's the he's the what, what was he what was he there for again? I forget in the running man. I just remember that he was there well, trying he's, fra to he's framed for murder. Yeah, I just remember that like he like, gets in trouble in like Bakersfield or something and then he's like in a game show in Los Angeles trying to do that. It's been a bit since I've seen it. Sure, yeah. that's based off a Stephen King book. Is it? The Running Man, yeah. Is it? Okay, I didn't even know that. Okay. Thank you for listening and watching to this episode of the One and a Half White Guys podcast. Be sure to follow us, rate us, and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast from. Don't forget to follow us on our Instagram at One and a Half White Guys Podcast on TikTok at One and a Half White Guys, and now on our YouTube, which is hopefully where you're watching this at One and a Half White Guys. And be sure to tell a friend to listen to the podcast where we say we talk about a movie and we kind of talk about the movie. Stay away from the fog. <laughs> there's, always it, there's always something in the fog. Always okay? something in the fog. If it's not the fog, it's something in the fucking mist too. <laughs> it's something everywhere. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Thank you to everyone that gave us responses on Reddit. And uh, if we, this is popular and people like it, maybe we'll open our own subreddit and just kind of ask people what they think of certain movies. But we seriously appreciate all you reaching out and, and being okay with this. Stay out of the fog. Stay out of the fog. <laughs> <laughs>